Tuesday morning, we will be hosting our Macmillan Coffee Morning. So if you'd like to get baking and you'd like to invite your friends along, you know, there's not many of us here that haven't been touched by cancer within our families. And it's an amazing cause and a nice way to raise money to have that get together and tell our stories and be united together raising money for a good cause. So we're just going to commit the service to God this morning and then we can carry on praising and worshipping his name. Father, we thank you that your presence is amongst us. Lord, your word says where two or three are gathered in your name, then you are there. So Lord, we believe that you are in our midst this morning. And Father, we just welcome you here as you have welcomed us. We just pray that everything that will be said and done will be according to your will. Lord, minister to our hearts, to our minds, to our souls as we lift up your name and we praise you. Lord, let your word go forward this morning as a hammer and as a sword and as a fire and accomplish all that you have ordained it to. Lord, just be with us and bless us, we pray in your name. Amen. Father, we just thank you. We thank you, Jesus. And we welcome you, Holy Spirit. Would Emma and would Katie please come forward? <laughs> Here this morning, as I was coming to church and as we was preparing, my phone is not stopped vibrating. I, I have a, an app that was everybody else had. Uh, news reports come in and about three or four this morning apparently there's a, a lottery winner has been found loads of money and I got me thinking whoever that is I'm not ready I just saw the, the highlights on my, fo- on my watch but I woke up this morning thinking he ain't got a care in the world he's got all that money but he's got nothing. Unless he knows Jesus Christ as his Lord and as his Savior, that money is worthless. Because tomorrow, if he, if he doesn't wake up, that money can't get him into heaven. All that money cannot get him into heaven. Salvation is free. Salvation is free. All you need is to know and accept Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. So even even though there's going to be lots of people trying to contact this guy and and give them their uh, sob story to see whether he'll donate some money to them, it's all useless. But I thank God that he allowed his son Jesus to come and live amongst us and to suffer and to die on that cross. So whosoever that accepts him and acknowledges him can spend eternity with him. And on that night he was betrayed. He took the bread and he broke it. And he gave thanks. And he said, this is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, he took the cup. The cup of the new covenant which represents the blood that I've shed, that has been shed for you, shed for me, as young on that cross. The blood that is still as powerful and still as precious today. The blood that flows from the ice to the ice mountain down to the lowest valley. That never stops working. That never sleeps. We thank you, Lord. 
Thank you, Jesus. Children are going to go to class. Yay! You know you're only a winner when the Sunday school teacher is the one doing all the dancing. So we pray for them this morning, Lord, that you would bless the children, that they would have an amazing time, that their teacher would just have a wonderful experience sharing with them the stories and the teaching. Lord, watch over them and bless them. Give them a great morning in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm forgetting to do a thousand things. Do you want to turn this off? Good morning. Do you know, as I start this morning, I, I feel really embarrassed. Don't you sit there thinking I would too, wearing that jacket. <laughs> no, I, I feel really embarrassed that um, the word I have for you this morning is the same word I've spoke to you before, and it's really strange. It's like, well, why am I bringing this word, but then to put it into context, last night in our breakthrough prayer meetings, and for those that don't know, we still, every Saturday since the beginning of the year, we have a breakthrough prayer meeting on a Saturday night for an hour where we, we, we don't come with a, a list of a thousand prayers, we just come with one request to God, God, breakthrough in our community, the lives of the people around us, not just our families, but everyone. So we've been doing that for some time. But last night, God began to speak to us prophetically. And I know that for many, there's a real burden on their hearts. And so if you're watching online, you'll have to bear with me because I need to just talk to the folks that are connected with this place. And um, God began to speak and he said, you know, th th this is what's going on. I know a lot of people are wondering, well, we've, we've prayed this and we've prayed that. And we've done this and we've done that. Why isn't there this huge move of God? Why does everything feel so still? And God began to speak about how before the tidal wave comes from the tsunami, there is a still moment when everything disappears away from the shore. The water is drawn away. You think the sea has vanished. And it might feel like that in our Christian walks that somehow it's all vanished that people aren't getting saved in large numbers, that everything we're doing isn't having the results that it would be expected to have. And, and you think, what's going on, God? And God says, you're in a moment of silence. You're in a moment of silence. But that silence won't last for long. And when it ends, it will be a deluge. It'll be a tidal wave. So it's really... And, and so... That got me thinking then, as, as I'd already kind of got the, the message for today and scratching my head and thinking, this is a bit strange, we're sharing the same message again, but this is the message. Be still. And know that I am God. Um, but what's really important is, when I read that, be still and know that I am God, I will be exalted among the nations. I will be honored through all the world. And I really think there's a word here, not just in the moment of how to be in a moment of God's stillness when it seems like nothing's happening, but also how to be in a moment of busyness when everything is happening. There's a word here about God's purpose in it all. And I think Sometimes we are so concerned with ourselves and what's going on around us and how it all fits into our lives, we miss the point. And the point is, as God says, I will be exalted. The point is God's glory, not our understanding. That's why God doesn't explain himself to us. Not our involvement, though God delights to get us involved. But what is it? The whole point of everything, from the dawn of creation to the very end of all ages, the point is this, that God is glorified in and through all things. I will be exalted. I think that's amazing. So I look at this and I think, well, why am I bringing this thought to you again? Be still and know that I am God. Psalm 46, why am I doing that? 
But God says it's a lesson that needs learning. And even though the messages have been preached, the lesson hasn't been understood. If we can't be still in the silence, we won't know how to be still in the busy moments of God's moving. And I find that the stillness is where God strengthens us. It's where God builds us. It's where God prepares us for that next piece of the life journey that he has for us. It's in that moment. And we all face different things at different times in our life. Sometimes there are seasons of ill health. Sometimes there are seasons of concerns for loved ones, for family. Sometimes there are seasons of bereavement. Solomon wrote in Ecclesiastes, there is a time for every purpose. But in it all and through it all, what I see when I look at Jesus' life is every time he was busy working, he would always take time to be still with God. I, I love that you, you've got all this stuff going on. You've got um, people getting healed, dead being raised, miracles are plenty, and they tell me that from the Bible that the, the, the crowd was so heavy around Jesus, the word they use in the Bible, good old-fashioned word, they were thronging him. That means they were all pressing in just to get near, to touch, to be close. It's a bit like, you know, you notice at the Queen's funeral, I, I noticed they had about three layers of fences. So if you got past one, you weren't getting past the other because otherwise the crowds would have got too close. But in Jesus' day, they didn't have the police and the army to keep everything in order. They just crowded in and they all wanted a piece of him. And I, I don't know about you, but sometimes, you know, it can feel like between family and work and everything else, everybody wants a slice of this pie and it, it can get very draining. You can feel like, wow, I, I just don't have enough of me to keep going. And yet Isaiah says, you know, when you come and wait on the Lord, you renew your strength. And that's the thing about waiting. <coughs> waiting is about being still before God. It's about being at peace with God, no matter what's going on around us. So we, we see it with the disciples in the boat. And, and what we have is this, this moment where um, they're all in the boat on this particular occasion, as it's described in the, um, the good news messages. Um, and if you don't know your Bible, they're the first four chapters of the New Testament, the second half of the Bible. And if you want to know more, come along and uh, share some time with us the Bible study, and we'll explain all that. But what I see is that on this particular occasion, Jesus, he's been busy. But he's flesh and blood. He might be God's son in human form, but he's still flesh and blood. He needs to rest. So he's asleep at the back of the boat. And I would imagine, because he had such an untroubled heart and mind, his sleep was sweet. It was restful. We know it was restful because he was sound asleep, and yet there was a storm going on around the boat. And Jesus is asleep at the back of the boat. I'm thinking, wow. It's pretty amazing. How many of us get a restful night's sleep in the midst of trouble? Someone rings me up and says, oh, I, I, can I see you? Can I, can I come and see you? That's me wrestling to get a good night's sleep. It's like, well, what's it about? You know, been in ministry so long, you know that when people want to see you often, it's either troubles they're going through or troubles they want you to go through. It's one or the other. So we're just praying, you know, well, God, make it, make it good. And, and I realized that someone asked me, how, how do I keep going in all this? I, I've learned. I, I just go and wait on him. The moment I have with him in stillness brings all the strength I need to go through what comes next. And after that and after that. And I see that with Jesus. I see that on one occasion, the crowds were all pressing in and, and all that. And, and he sent the disciples away and none of them challenged him. But he said, right, you guys get in the boat. We're going to the other side. You go ahead. I'll, I'll catch you up. They didn't think anything of it. And then he sent the crowds away. And then he, he went up on the mountain to be 
alone with God. He was being still with his father. And that is the anchor of our souls. Paul says it's, it's a hope we have that when we go to him, he's there for us, that he's ready to listen and he's ready to care. But being still is where we go beyond offloading a thousand and one concerns. And we should offload our concerns on God. We should share and give God what's worrying us, what's troubling us, what's burdening us, the hassles of the day, those little niggles. Because if we don't give them to God, then they just stay in the back of our minds and they, they rob us of our peace. And yet when we find that restful moment in God, we get to a point where we've given God the burdens of our heart. Do you know there's a song by, um, I remember hearing it by a Christian singer called Amy Grant years ago. And whether, I don't know whether she's in favor or out of favor these days. I don't know if she's had some troubles in her life. But she sung this song and it's always stuck with me. Lay down the burdens of your heart and let your daddy lift it. I thought that's just awesome. That's a, that is a watchword for life, isn't it? Is just give God your troubles. Because what will be, will be. And us worrying about it won't change it. And that's the moment we all live through. You know when something's come in? Um, worry is the unfounded concern of what might happen, worst case scenario. And so what we do, we fill our lives with the what if. And it's amazing, the minute something happens, no matter how bad it is, the stress is gone. So even when something bad happens that we didn't want to happen, it's more painful to live in the stress before it happens than it is to survive afterwards. But when I learn to be still with God, it takes that stress moment away. So I am able to walk with him and live with him in whatever happens. And life can be hard, can't it? Let's not kid ourselves. So I, so I see this idea that being still is... A life-changing, critical issue for all believers. We've got to learn to live in a place of stillness with God. Not like we walk along almost like um, one of these cartoon characters, you know, walk along, lay so far back I'm almost lying down as I walk. It's not that. But there's a peace. There's a peace. That's why Jesus said, you know, my peace I, I give to you. My peace I leave with you. It's, it's not that life's going to be great. It's not that you're not going to have to face those heartaches and those pains that come. But I want you to know that even though they come, you don't have to live in distress. You can live in peace, even in troubled times. It's possible. Because God gives it. And so that's what I see. But I also see this idea that when I read, be still and know that I am God, it's not about inactivity. So does that make sense? Because I think sometimes we associate being still with not doing anything. But a better way of putting it would be still your heart, not your hands. Do what needs to be done. Do what you're called to do. Be busy for the kingdom. But don't let your heart be stressed in turmoil through it. Let this be still. Let these be busy. Because as the adage goes, the devil makes work for idle hands. And it's true, isn't it? How often we get distracted and we'll fill our lives with so many things if we don't fill our lives with kingdom of heaven purpose. And how often the restlessness of our hearts pulls us away from kingdom service and kingdom busyness because our hearts are restless and we get distracted and we get, and we become, you know, we almost become like soldiers in the trenches where the enemy fire is so heavy we can't even put our head up to see where we're shooting. And, and that's what happens. And that's why God says, you know, it's, it's a heart thing. It's about knowing not to be stressed. 
and knowing where to go to relieve the stress. We go to Jesus. When we go to Jesus and we relieve the stress of the moment, we become so much more able to demonstrate the love, the peace, and the grace of God to those around us. It's not that some people just have it and some people don't. We all have been given the access and the opportunity. It's just learning how to do it. Because we can be in the busiest of situations. I, I tell you that um, at one stage in my life, I worked for a particular employer and it was an extremely stressful environment. They used to joke that if you can survive here, you can work anywhere. I've got a few comments on that of my own, but let's leave that for my memoirs. <laughs> but I realized that in the difficulty of that moment, it's hard to explain to you why it was so stressful, but it was an extremely abusive environment where every day it depended what mood the senior um, boss was in as to how the day went. If he had a bad day at home, we were all in for hell at work. Not because we'd done anything wrong, just because he was in a bad mood, we were having it. We were his dog to kick, and we got kicked often. And it was hard to go to work and do that, but I have a wife, I have children, I have a mortgage. You know, in my former life, I'd have got up and said, I'm not putting up with this nonsense, I'm out of here. And I'd have said a few things. In fact, on a number of occasions, one or two staff actually did. It was that bad. But through it all, God pressed me into a corner with him. And I learned to survive. And then learning to survive, I learned to thrive. And so my relationship with God grew at a rate and in a way that would have taken decades. But in that extreme moment of life, through those hard, difficult experiences and the very emotional and challenging way in which I had to live, every day I would get up and the first thing I'd do is I would grab Jesus. God, you've got to get me through this, God. I don't know what I'm going to face today, but I can do it with you. God, help. And that was something that God taught me that even in the busyness of life, I can have peace and stillness in my heart. It's not about when things aren't going wrong, when I haven't got troubles in my life, when I've got five minutes, I can turn the telly off and I can sit in the corner and have a quiet time. You should steal those moments all the time. I've learned through this that we don't find time we make time. Because if you wait to find time, there will never be enough of it. But if you make time, then what you do is you deliberately and intentionally put other things aside so you have time for Jesus. And in doing that, you will find God's blessing and reward on your life in, in, in just in layers and levels that are hard to explain. Because I see that. So it is about learning not just to be still and know he's God, he's got this, but it's learning to know that in the, the busyness of life and everything that's going on, the hustle and bustle, the aggro and the hassle and the hurts of life, I can walk in his peace and stillness. And then my life is bringing him glory. God gets no glory from my stress. He gets no glory from my distress. He gets no glory from my absence. He gets no glory from my distractedness. God doesn't get glory from all the stuff that gets in the way. What God gets glory from is the moments where I let his work show through my life. And that comes through walking in a place of trust with him. Be still. I'm God. I've got this. Even though it's not what you want, even though your heart hurts over what's got to come, it's okay. I will walk with you. I will be there for you. 
And if you can't cope, I'll carry you. That's God's word to us all. God's got this. Because life happens. And Jesus said, be of good cheer. Not because life is going to happen. Not because you're going to get disappointed or, or any of that stuff. But actually, be of good cheer because I've overcome the world. So there's nothing you're going to face that I can't walk you through. Isn't that lovely? I love that. That's a great way of seeing Jesus. So I see this, be still, know that I'm God, that being still isn't just about being idle and inactive. It's about having a, a sense of God's well-being in every moment, which is why Paul says, that's my hope. No matter what happens, God will come through. That's my hope that I have as an anchor to the soul, steadfast and sure, gone through the curtain. That's my hope. Jesus is right there. And everything I face, he's right there, sogging on, on God's uh, robes, I suppose, whatever we might say. You know, Dad, Dad, come on, come on. Let, let's get in there quick and help that person. They're hurting. God, God, quick, that person's just lost a loved one. Let's just go and fill their house with peace. Let's give them comfort. Let's give them that sense of our close, close embrace. God, that person's facing uncertainty over employment. God, that person's really struggling with loneliness and hopelessness. Everything, everything that we all go through, individually and together, God is with us. And he says, don't forget it. Calm your heart. I'm God. I've got this. I love that. And when it comes to our personal lives, how much more our corporate life as a church. We look around and we distress about this or about that, about the lack of availability for people to help with this or to, to join in with that or whatever else it is and the troubles that we face as a, as, a, as a church and all churches face troubles. In the world you will have tribulation. Church is not exempt. But be of good cheer. I've got this. So the moments of stillness are going to turn into a moment of flood. But we won't cope in a moment of flood if we don't know how to be still in the moment of peace. Because if you can't be still in peace, you can't be still in busyness. And so I see these things. And then, lastly, I, I see this idea that... <coughs> Do you love me this morning? Oh, what's he going to say? Do you love me this morning? Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. God's saying, it's not about what you want. It's not about what you think should happen. It's not about your plans. It's not. It's about his. It's not about the pastor's plans, your pastor's ideas. It's not. It's about his. My job isn't to come up with ideas. My job is to listen to what he has to say and do what he tells me, even if it doesn't make sense. And sometimes, just to test me, he asks me to do stuff that doesn't make sense. Just to test my faithfulness. To test the trust of others. And what God commands us to do is to be still. Don't stress. Don't worry about it. One of the biggest challenges the church in the UK faces is that everybody's an expert. It's a bit like a football match. Everybody, however many thousands of people are sitting on that stadium, they all know better than the manager and the coaches and the players on the pitch. And they're all shouting that the manager and the coaches and the players on the pitch would hear them from the back of the crowd. Because they all know better but there's only one who knows. His name is God. And so I see in the stillness of the moment that a lot of our stress and trouble comes out of our plans and our designs and our desires. I want this this way, God. God, why isn't that that way? God, why do I have to go through this journey? I've got a better journey in mind than this. You know, God, I want a million pounds from the lottery. And God says, you really think you need the lottery? 
if I knew that you needed a million pounds, the check would be on the doorstep tomorrow. But God says, I know what you need from what you want, and I know what's good for you from what isn't. God knows. God's not unfamiliar with us as people. But God's plans and purposes for our lives, and that's how Jeremiah brings it, I know the plans I have for you. I'm not planning to hurt you. I'm not planning to harm you. I have plans for good for you. That's what the prophetic word from Jeremiah is. But what I see is that the ultimate destination of it all is, but you need to know it's not about you. It's about him. I've been watching, I want to be topical this morning, so I've been watching the thousands upon thousands of people. Some people camped out for days outside the castle or they camped outside the um, streets in London so they could get a prime place and they could be there. But at the end of the day, and, and I wouldn't have it any other way because after all her years of service, the Queen deserved the rightful accolade for her years of service and duty to this nation and what she's done for us as a nation and the dignity with which she has presided over the end of the empire because she's the one who's had to sign off on the nation's parting from what was an empire. She's had to put the finishing touches and she did it with such grace. I was really impressed with much of what she had to do. But I look at it all and I think about all those thousands of people and they're all, I want a position and I want to get a camera spot. And you could see them jostling. And I mean, they were pretty good, mostly in the crowd. There wasn't any argy-bargy, but you could see people were pushing. It's like, I've got to be here and I've got to be there. But at the end of the day, on the hour when the bell struck, it was all about that lady's body in that carriage, on that gun carriage going down that street. It wasn't about anything else at all other than that one person who has long since left this earth as we as a nation rightfully bade her farewell. And I think so often in our own limited understanding, life is all about us, what's going on around us, what I want, what I'm going through. It, it becomes quite traumatic and troublesome because it's all about what I'm not getting, I'm not being heard, I am not having what I feel I should have, I'm, I'm not getting this or I'm not getting this or, or I'm not having opportunity to do that or it's about they're not doing the things that I want the way I want them to uh, and all that stuff and God says, who's God? Wh who's God? Be still and know I'm God. I'm the one who'll be exalted. I'm the one who'll have my way. I'm the one who'll have my purposes. It's my word that will accomplish the purpose for which I send it. It's my church that I'm building. So even if men or women in leadership make mistakes, I'll still put it right because it's my church and I'm building it. And you might think there should be 10,000 people sitting here right now, but I know when it's time for that. And I know when it's not. I'm God. And the greatest challenge for us all in being still is to learn to trust him. And if we examined the motives of our hearts, I have found myself over the years that most of the stuff that gives me stress is when I'm not trusting him. And I'm looking at the circumstances and the situations instead. And I have peace when instead of worrying about what's going on, I'm still in him. And I'm convinced that as a church, as we get ready for what God's about to do, this foundational principle of being still in God no matter what is at the very heart of the nature and character of what God is doing here. And I'm convinced for every believer 
that when we can learn to trust his sovereignty. To finish with this, see, I, I see this in the Bible so often in the Bible stories, the accounts of Jesus ministering. The people who came to Jesus for their miracles that are mentioned, they're usually at a point where there's no hope other than in the impossible. Chai was his daughter. Don't bother the master. He's already dead. You think of others, same thing. Th there's no hope. Blind Bartimaeus, he had, no, he had no hope. What did he have to lose? Shouting and making a scene and making an embarrassment of himself. What did he have to lose? But if he didn't shout, he wouldn't have got. And I see so many other occasions where actually people had gone beyond trying to figure it out themselves and work out how and what and why. The woman with the issue with blood, she'd spent everything she had on cures that didn't work. And then she finally got the sense to go and find Jesus. And I realize that so often, as the hymn writer said, oh, what peace we often forfeit. Oh, what needless pain we bear because we don't carry everything to God. And I'm going to add a verse to that and leave it with him there. Be still. Stop trying to figure it out. Stop trying to, why is this like this and why is that like that? If that was a burden for you, God would have put you in a position for you to carry that burden. And he'd have equipped you for it too. God's good. He loves us. He has a plan for us individually and as a church and i am assured that if we will rest in him more things will be less painful and more joyful in every moment of our lives amen